Father God, we just thank you that you are our one defense, Lord Jesus. You are the only defense we need, Lord Jesus. When Satan comes and he tries to despair us and he says of everything that we've done wrong and he points out all our mistakes, Lord Jesus, you are our defense. Your blood is our defense. You stand for us, Lord Jesus. And you say, because of me, because of what I've done, they are clean, Lord Jesus. And we can be clean in your sight today, Lord Jesus. We can be dressed in white, Lord Jesus. We can come confidently before your throne, Lord Jesus, because we have a living hope, Lord Jesus, because you died for us and you made us worthy, Lord Jesus. Even though there was nothing we could do, we were helpless, Lord Jesus. But you made us worthy, Lord Jesus, because you are worthy and you have called us worthy to come into your presence. Lord Jesus, we thank you, Lord Jesus. What can we offer you, Lord Jesus, in response? All we can give you is our praise and our worship, Lord Jesus, which you gave us anyway, Lord Jesus. Anything we give you, you gave us already, Lord Jesus. We thank you, Lord Jesus, for your sacrifice. We thank you for your living hope, Lord Jesus. We thank you that in stormy times and good times, we can call on you and trust you because you are a faithful God. You will never let us down, Lord Jesus. Never let us down. You will never leave us alone. You will never forsake us. You will never leave us. You will walk with us every day of our lives, Lord Jesus, if we only ask you to. And Lord Jesus, I just pray now for what you have laid on Chris's heart, Lord Jesus. I pray that you would help him to confidently proclaim what you have given him this morning to encourage and challenge your church, Lord Jesus. We ask this in your mighty name, Lord Jesus, in your faithful name. Amen. 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 Thank you, Rach, Karina, and the team. Never take for granted the uh, freedom that we get to worship. I'm going to pray and then uh, share with you what I feel like God is laying on my heart at this time. Lord, thank you for the chance to preach. Um, I love being able to preach, and I pray that you'd open up our hearts and our minds to be challenged by it, Lord, and to be convicted and to be um, yeah, moved, Lord, not by my voice, not by what I say, but by the Holy Spirit and by what you um, want to do in this place, Lord. Thank you that you use people, even though you don't need to, you want to. And I pray that uh, we just have a great time together as we continue to worship you this morning. Amen. 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 Um, we've sang a couple of songs with the word in that I'm going to be speaking on today, and that word is hope. I'm going to be speaking to us about fresh hope. Everybody say fresh hope. Fresh hope. Say it a bit better. Fresh hope. fresh hope. There we are. We're waking up. Okay, so fresh hope. What is fresh hope? Well, uh, that's something that's been stirred up in my heart, especially over the kind of Christmas period. Um, I touched on it a little bit on Christmas Day. But I believe that as we enter 2020 and you have all these cliched kind of new year, new me, new decade, new me. Um, it's, a, it's 2020 vision, all these kind of things that, that keep cropping up and you keep seeing it. But what does fresh hope mean to us today as a church of probably 90 odd percent Christian uh, in Bethel this morning? What does fresh hope look like? Well, I'm going to aim to, uh, to share with us this morning in a, in a way that I hope stirs us all up to leave this building better than we came in with a fresh hope, with a new hope, ready to go out and, and share the good news of Jesus with people. Are you with me? Good. Some of you are, hopefully more by the end of it. So I'm going to read from Romans 15, verse 13. If you've got a Bible, I'd like you to open it to that, please. If you've got it on an iPad phone or if you just know the Bible off by heart, you can just sit and look at me. So Romans 15, 13, I'm going to read this verse after I've had a little bit of a drink whilst you grab hold of that. If you've got a Bible, I'd like it if you actually had it open. Um, if you've got a book like a Bible like this. Um, to leave it open as well on this passage so it says in verse 13 of Romans chapter 15 may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit that is a verse that I would put into the category of verses you've read many times and then you read it again and it goes oh wow I've never read it like that before. You know those kind of verses where you kind of read it and read it and read it and then suddenly you read it and God opens up something new to you. Well, that verse right there is something that's been opened up to me in a brand new way over these last few weeks. And I hope that um, how I've been inspired to, to carry a fresh hope and how I've been inspired to overflow with hope, as this verse says, 
And I hope that I can kind of share that with you in a way that inspires us all as believers in Jesus to overflow with hope today. Because if there's one thing for certain, this world needs some hope right now. This world is desperate for some hope. I don't know everybody in this room. I know quite a lot of people. And I know that there's lots of different uh, types of people, different ages, uh, different theological viewpoints, um, different experiences of church. But what I do know is that if we follow Jesus, which as I said earlier, most of the room do, then one thing that again cannot be argued is that we all represent Jesus in some way. If you've chosen to follow him, if you've been baptized, if you've made a decision to follow Jesus, whether that have been recently or many years ago, there is no doubt that every one of us in this room that's chosen to do that represents him. Fact. Now you might go, I don't, I don't represent him because I never share my faith. Well, guess what? In that, you are representing him because you're not sharing it with anybody. So we either represent him well or we represent him poorly. We know what God thinks about those that are in the middle, the lukewarm category, which I'm not going to get into today. But I believe that each of us today has the opportunity to overflow with hope because it says it in the Bible. So therefore, it must be an option for some of us. Or is it an option for all of us? I think it's all of us. Some nods, good. We're in agreement. It matters how we represent him. It really matters how we represent him. We're kind of uh, halfway through January almost already already thinking of Easter, already thinking of summer, next Christmas. I saw a countdown on Facebook the other day to next Christmas. Funny, it's like we're wishing life away. But I want to challenge each of us today to bring fresh hope with us because there are many, many, many people out there who Jesus wants us to share that fresh hope with this year and onwards from there. There's some things as I, as I, as I, as I, push towards the end of my, um, my degree in theology. Um, I can't believe that come May I will have finished it, um, which I'm, I'm really proud of in, in terms of studying. Anybody that knows me knows that I'm not an academic. I left school when I was 16 or 17 and uh, didn't really have the greatest grades or anything. But I'm on, the, I'm on the final stretch now where, you know, I'm writing a dissertation. It's like, what on earth is that? Who knows, but I'm having a go. Um, and, and, and as I, but as, as I approach the kind of um, finishing point and, and, and looking forward to that and whatever the next stages are for, for me personally, um, one of the things that is the biggest frustration for me is the things that we theologically and other ology or whatever word is um, disagree on basically what we argue about as Christians because some of the stuff that we argue about is pathetic in my opinion and you know what in a room full of this people I could do a demonstration and, and ask a question and half the room would go one way and the other way and you'd really 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 believe in the answer that you give but some half the room would probably be wrong that's the same with lots of different things in life there are some things that you were right in and there's some things that we're wrong in you have an opinion, you have a belief, you have a, a biblical background, but even then it can be interpreted in different ways. And, and sometimes we get so muddled up in this kind of conversation of, well, I think this way is the right way. Or what about that way? What about this way? That we forget that actually we're on the same team. Don't worry so much about those that believe what you already believe. How about those that don't believe what you believe? We're going to watch a, a, a short video. Um, it's called The Trolley Problem, which some of you may have seen before. Um, but as we're watching this, I want you to have a look and think about what you would do in the situation that is presented to us. Thank you. A runaway train is heading towards five workers on a railway line. There's no way of warning them but you're standing near a lever that operates some points. Switch the points, and the train goes down a spur. Trouble is, there's another worker on that bit of track, too. But it's one fatality instead of five. Should you do that? Many people think the right thing to do would be to switch the points, to sacrifice one to save five, since that produces the best outcome possible. Now imagine the train heading for the workers again. This time it can only be stopped by pushing a very large man off a bridge. His great bulk would stop the train, but he'd die. Should you do that? Most people say no. But why not? Both thought experiments are cases of sacrificing one to save five. What the trolley problem examines is whether moral decisions are simply about outcomes or about the manner in which you achieve them. Some utilitarians argue that the two cases are not importantly different from each other. Both have similar consequences, and consequences are all that really matter. In each case, one person dies and five are saved. The best option in each harrowing situation. But lots of people say they would switch the points 
but they wouldn't push the man off the bridge. Are they simply inconsistent, or are they on to something? So if we had uh, a little bit more time, I might uh, offer you the opportunity to share what your thought would be, what you would do in that situation. And I'm sure some of you in your mind have got an idea of what you would do. Um, and just before I move on, there is one option that we're going to watch in just a second that some of you may have thought of. So if we could just show that second video, please, someone's come up with a solution. Here is one option. Uh oh, Nicholas, this train is going to crash into these five people. Should we move the train to go this way or should we let it go that way? Which way should the train go? I'm not sure how many of you had that idea, but it made me laugh anyway. <laughs> Although it's a, it's a funny video, of course, well, the, the second one makes it a little bit funnier. Um, but I would say that going on a, a different journey to where that is aimed for and what that kind of discussion that, that leads to, when I watched that, I thought, you know what, that did happen. That did happen. As we sit in church today and we, as believers in Jesus, we know that that train journey that was going to wipe out all those other people, that's us. But there was another option that Jesus took, and Jesus was the sacrifice for each of us. That is the hope that I'm talking of today, because without that hope, we'd all be gone. We'd have been cleaned out with that train or trolley or whatever it was. The fresh hope that I'm talking of today is a, is a, is a fresh, not, not a new belief, because I, I'm not trying to change what we believe, but it's a fresh hope and a fresh belief in what we actually live for. Because if you were in that situation and you were to witness something as, as awful as that would be, it, it, it would affect your mind, it would affect you. But what Jesus did was so, so much bigger, it affects every single person that ever has lived, is living today, or will live. Because he diverted the train. When it should be us that was punished for our sin, for our mistakes, for our bad choices, he diverts the train and takes the sacrifice on himself. That is the hope, the hope in Jesus, Christ in me, the hope of glory. Now because of that sacrifice, we need to do more. We can't just sit and go, thank you, Jesus, amen, we sing and we worship you. Yes, we do that, of course. But we've got to take it on with us and make sure we share that hope with plenty of other people. If you call yourself a follower of Jesus today, it should be evident often. More than just how you publicly worship, more than just how you act when you're around Christians, uh, more than just how you like integrate in terms of church like this and, and visiting um, you know, church friends and things like that where, where church is, is the normal thing and maybe being a Christian is the normal thing. It should be evident on a daily basis. If people know you and meet you and spend time with you, I'm not saying that we go and shout down their face that we love Jesus and they're going to burn in hell. I am yet to see that work ever. I don't think it does um, in terms of an aggressive way. But when you leave them, when you leave their presence, they certainly should feel better and they should know that you carry something that they haven't got. Romans 15, 13, we should overflow with hope. Overflow with hope. Think about the people that you have interacted with over the last week. Would they say of you that you overflow with hope? Even in just the last week, things have happened on our planet that cause people to panic. World War III, is it inevitable? We're all gonna get called up to fight in another war. All these kind of, the, the kind of talk that's going on. The, the latter isn't going to happen, by the way. It's not going to be like it was in World War II where you get called up and, and have to go and fight in the trenches. War's a little bit different today. But there's fear, there's panic, there's worry. How do you converse with people about those topics? I think it matters as Christians how we talk about it. Not negatively, not in fear, not panicking, not worrying, but offering that there's a solution to this. There's hope beyond this world. There's hope beyond the circumstances that we're in. Now, there are so many biblical stories that we could read of hope, um, but I've picked one that's uh, one of my favorite stories, and again, I'd like you to, to read it with me. So we're going to go to Mark chapter 5. So I'll just give you a moment to find that on your gadgets or in your hands or whatever. Um, Roman, uh, sorry, Mark chapter 5, verse 35. We're just going to read a few verses um, for a situation that needed hope. And what, what did they turn to? So Mark 5, 35, it says, While Jesus was still speaking, some men came from the house of Jairus, the synagogue ruler. Your daughter is dead, they said. 
Why bother the teacher anymore? Ignoring what they said, Jesus told the synagogue ruler, don't be afraid, just believe. He did not let anyone follow him except Peter, James, and John, the brother of James. When they came to the home of the synagogue ruler, Jesus saw a commotion with people crying and wailing loudly. He went in and said to them, why all this commotion and wailing? The child is not dead, but asleep. But they laughed at him. After he put them all out, he took the child's father and mother and the disciples who were with him and went in where the child was. He took her by the hand and said to her, Talitha kum, which means little girl, I say to you, get up. Immediately the girl stood up and walked around. She was 12 years old. At this, they were completely astonished. And we'll stop there. A desperate situation in which hope was needed. And despite the fact that, that this girl was dead, this guy had hope in somebody. And he went to find him and he found him. But even then, that wasn't it. There were other opportunities for him to turn away. When people said to him, she's dead, what are you bothering him for? Go away. He could have gone away, but he didn't. He still had hope. Maybe a little bit more fresh hope. Please, I am desperate. I am desperate. We can read that situation with a oh, lovely little rose-tinted kind of perfect little world because it all ends happily. But we know the truth in this world that that kind of situation and others that some of us face or, or have all faced at times, desperate situations that we're in, they affect people in a way that without the hope of Jesus, I, I just don't know what else there is to offer people. And I know there'll be people in this room today that are in that kind of scenario where your world is crumbling, where everything around you is falling apart, where you may have tr tried Jesus, but the answer wasn't what you thought it was going to be. I want to offer you a fresh hope today and simply say, don't give up. Don't give up hope. Don't give up hope in Jesus. In that story, they were wise who they turned to. But I think for us as believers, we turn to the wrong things at times. When problems come, we turn to social media to tell the world, or we turn to people that don't believe in God and ask them for their opinions, or we gossip about the situation, or we continually repeat the situation every single time we meet somebody, something that happened to us two, three, four, five years ago. Still talking about it. Because it hurts, doesn't it? It hurts. Things hurt us. Things cause us to lose hope. Things cause us to doubt God or doubt God's goodness. Does God really care about me if he'd let that thing happen to me? These things are real. They go on in our minds. And it's okay to think like that because as I've said before, if we didn't think like that, then we would be God. But it won't, it's not okay to remain in that situation. And the reason for that is because not only does it affect you and your life and and. and I don't want to sound harsh, but you know when you're in that kind of woe is me situation, it, it usually only affects you in a negative way. Other people around you kind of carry on living their life and, and they're like, oh man, you're going to talk to me about that again. Come on, what, what are we going to do moving forward? But not only does it affect you, if we truly believe what we do, that we should overflow with hope, that we should carry a hope in Jesus, then every time we're around people, if we're negative and we're bad news, they don't want to be around us. And they would think, hmm, you believe in Jesus, yet you're the most negative person I've ever met or the most unforgiving person I've ever met. What, what is it about Jesus that's different to anything else that I know? That's why I, I believe and I'm, I'm, I'm challenged in my own life to have a fresh hope this year, a fresh hope, a fresh new beginnings, new opportunities to share with people what I really believe. Because if I truly believe what I do, there are a lot of people I love going to hell forever. People need to hear about this hope. We can spend a lot of time discussing things, our opinions, our thoughts, our arguments, debating things. I don't think there's anything necessarily wrong with that as long as it's done in the right way and done in love. But people need Jesus more than they need our opinions. People need Jesus more than they need our woe is me stories. Now I'm not saying that when you go through rough times, keep it to yourself, nobody cares. Absolutely not. Because the one I'm talking of cares more than anybody else. But he doesn't want you to stay that way. He doesn't want you to stay in that depression, that anxiety, that fear, those suicidal thoughts, those worries. 
thinking of the, the family situation that's still causing trouble in your life when it happened 10 years ago. Get help, get support, absolutely. But God wants to help you move on from that with a fresh hope. To say, yeah, those things did happen. Yes, they hurt. Yes, they really, really hurt. But look what Jesus has done to bring me through this. He can do the same for you. But we lose hope sometimes. I'm going to do a, a very quick demonstration. I need five, you three there, and you two boys, come here, come and stand at the front for me there. So when we, when we first become a Christian, or when you meet somebody that first becomes a Christian, you can start with that. This is what happens. This is hope. Hold it up. You just drop Jesus well then. <laughs> Hold it up. So what happens is somebody that doesn't know Jesus, they, their life's kind of going on as, as normal. And this is your little world. And what happens is when that person comes to know Jesus for the first time and their world is like, oh my gosh, I didn't understand this. I'm saved. I'm forgiven. All the things I've done wrong. I feel so good. Have you ever met those? They're quite annoying actually because they just don't shut up about Jesus. They just want to tell you all the time, Jesus, 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 Jesus. Well, this is your little world. Just drop it in there. And what happens is that basically takes up most of your life. Hope is so evident because people see Jesus in you. Because every time they ask you where you are, you're at church again, again. You're smiling all the time when you used to be miserable. Or you're talking about Jesus because when he fills you, you can't help it. So just hold that for me a second because what happens is life continues. And then suddenly you meet a Christian who's not very nice, actually horrible. They treat you really badly. So what happens to this hope? Well, hope stays the same, same size, because it's big, it's huge. The hope never changes in what Jesus has done for you, but our world grows and suddenly the hope doesn't fill the jar as much as it did. It's still there. And every now and again on a Sunday, everybody knows I'm at church. And when things are good and I'm having an emotional time listening to worship music, everybody knows that I love Jesus because I feel good in that time. But then you wander back into church and that person that was horrible to you, you see him. Um, and it just takes that hope back a little bit. But it's okay, because it's still taking up the majority of that thing. But then suddenly, something else terrible happens to us. We pray for something, and, and we really want this thing to happen. And we believe in this Jesus that gives us this hope that's filled our life for the, for the time that it has. And we pray, and we pray, and we pray, and we speak out in faith that Jesus is going to do this. And then it doesn't happen. Now, the hope hasn't changed again. But our life has grown. The situation has grown. That person still was horrible. In fact, it's probably doubled now. You've probably found out that lots of Christians aren't actually very nice. You may have even been hurt in church worse than you were ever hurt outside of church. But also, that, that, that's okay because God's still good. God's still good. So it doesn't matter what people think. It doesn't matter what people say because God's still good. But then I prayed for my grandma to be healed and she wasn't and she died. What happens to that hope? Because the truth remains true. And you can see where we're going. And I'll move it on a little bit quicker because you two can have the big ones. Because then all of a sudden, life continues. And actually, because of these situations that have happened in Cayenne's glass, our church attendance has gone down a little bit. Because maybe God's not as good as we, we maybe first believed that time when it filled our life. And we met more Christians. We've moved churches now. Because that's the problem. It's that church, isn't it? It's always the church we've left. You know, it doesn't matter sometimes when people continually talk about the church they've left. Like, do you want to go back? Don't shut up about it. But we do. Because it fills in, it fills our life, doesn't it? The problems. Because all of those people, they were horrible to me. They didn't understand me. They hurt me. They were mean to me. And I've also prayed for some, for some other things now. And that hope still remains the same. But you see what happens when it goes into that bigger black bucket of a world. Jesus' truth hasn't changed. Do you see that? The same size, that little pink ball that represents the hope that Jesus brings doesn't change. But our world and our experiences do until eventually we get to the point where a few years ago we went to church once and I was up the front and put my hand up to become a Christian. And for a few weeks, a few people knew about that and my world was all about Jesus. But then years on, if we don't have a fresh hope, if we don't continually overflow with hope, 
eventually it gets into a bucket that's so big that just part of that bucket that gets filled with all the other nonsense of life and somewhere in there somewhere from a past experience is Jesus this hasn't changed size since the beginning of the demonstration for what we need to aim to do is that when all of these circumstances happen all of these things happen people are mean to us the church is horrible to us can we get back to a place where no matter what our world is going through no matter what has happened in our world no matter what circumstances have happened and I'm going to re reel off a list of them in a moment can we maintain that Jesus the hope of Jesus is still the biggest thing in our life that's what the world needs if we give these guys a round of applause you can just put that stuff down Thanks, Ben. Maybe you relate to one of those things, and sometimes I say things that might sound a bit like, ooh, hard hitting, but it's, it's true. I've been in church long enough to know that it's true. I've been there in all of those areas when the church hurts you, when those that stood by you, you thought through the hardest of times and, and would be there for you through thick and thin, all of a sudden, trouble hits and they go. And in fact, they don't just step out of the way. They actually speak really badly about you. And that hurts. It really does hurt. I'm not suggesting that it doesn't. But if the hope of Jesus remains as the central point to your life, it means that no matter what circumstances the enemy will put in your way, will, not might, will, Jesus remains the hope that your life is lived for. What else might cause us to lose hope as we begin to look to, to wrap this up and move on into, into what God might be wanting you to do today? As I said, we fall out with fellow believe, believers, watching somebody over there worshipping that you know has been horrible to you, even the day before, thinking, how could they do that? If everybody knew about them, what I know, I'm going to tell everyone. All of a sudden, five songs have gone on and you're not even spoken to Jesus. It happens. Christians hurt us. Relationship hasn't worked out. Our marriage isn't what it was. In fact, we're not even married anymore. Because so-and-so hurt me. My ex hurt me. Those things are awful. But we can't keep talking about it every single day for the rest of our lives. We've got to go through a process of, of getting help, support, absolutely. But not forever. Because despite circumstances, and hear my heart in this, I am not saying, oh, just grow up, toughen up. Not at all tough stuff hurts you've got to get the help you need but it can't be the dominant thing in your life forever otherwise what's the point you might as well go and be with Jesus sooner but Jesus wants you here for a reason things haven't gone the way that we wanted prayers not answered the way that we wanted someone isn't being nice to us that's where you could grow up a little bit sometimes people just don't like you this is the way it is sin we fall into sin and we can't forgive ourselves for something that we've done. It's all right, because you don't have to forgive yourself. It was done by Jesus. But again, get help with that. Health issues, mental health issues, depression, anxiety, suicidal thoughts. All of these things I've said, there will be people in this room that probably think, blink and heck, I got all of them. The list goes on and on and on. Because where is it? There it is. The truth of what Jesus did never changes, never changes no matter what happens, no matter how many times someone's mean to you, no matter how many times you might pray something and you don't quite grasp why God didn't answer that prayer. The truth of what the Bible says about what Jesus did never changes. But he wants you to grasp hold of that today, I know, because I'm challenged in it, because the stakes are too high for us not to grasp hold of it and carry that hope with us into the world that is panicking, that Donald Trump's gonna blow everybody up that the, another government's going to shoot down a passenger plane with 160 odd people on board or to bring it more closer to home your husband or your wife's going to leave you you've got to go to the doctors and you think it might be bad you've already been told by a doctor that it's over there's so many other situations that cause us to lose hope to cause us not to forget that decision that we made necessarily years ago, potentially, but as the green, big green bucket showed, it can't just become a little corner of your life. It'll be evident and life will become tough. And then all of a sudden, when you need to get back to Jesus, you've got to dig through everything else. Go, where is he? Where is he? Where is he? Thankfully, he's always there for us. 
but the baggage that we carry sometimes is unnecessary. We carry a hope that goes beyond all earthly circumstances. There isn't much that frustrates me more than negative, miserable Christians. I'm not saying that sometimes we don't feel that way because we do, but it shouldn't be all the time. If your hope has dwindled, get it sorted today so that you can help others find that hope. There's some Christians I know that I wish didn't tell other people that they were Christians because the way that I believe they represent Jesus isn't how Jesus would want them to. I can see people nodding. Hopefully we're not all thinking of the same person. But Bethel, it's time to raise the levels. Are you with me? I can see lots of people in, in agreement and, and I know that there's people in this room that maybe haven't gone to church that long. So don't panic. Don't think, oh man, alive. I've only been a Christian last week and I, 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 like, I, I've sinned. I sinned the other day and I didn't know you were meant to sin after, after Jesus had, had come into my life. And No, you're not meant to sin, but you will. <laughs> so don't panic. But even you, person that has made a decision recently, even you, person, people that have never made a decision to follow Jesus, I want to say to you today that there is hope in Jesus Christ. He is the reason that I live. I don't get paid or a bonus to say that. There are plenty of other jobs I could do. A lot easier, trust me. But I absolutely believe it, and I know that the majority are with me in it too. The hope that Jesus gives us is better than anything else anything else even if Cardiff beat Swansea today or the other way around or whatever else you're hoping for I assure you the best news you will hear today is the gospel of Jesus Christ the good news of Jesus Christ churches on a Sunday should have more or as many non-believers in the congregation as believers I didn't get an amen <laughs> when did you last bring someone to church because you know if you're um, in that first little pot, that's the, probably the best time where you ever bring people to church because it's changed your life. When it's the big green bucket, not so much. I want to encourage us to move back that way. And it might be a bucket at a time. That's okay. We're here to help you with that. But the stakes are too high for us to accept mediocrity in our Christian walk. If you call yourself a follower of Jesus, as I wrap up, it should be evident often. It's time to carry fresh hope everywhere we go. Maybe you don't believe, maybe you've moved away from faith, maybe circumstances caused you to hate church. Please don't give up on Jesus. I apologize for the way that the church and Christians have represented him poorly if that has affected your walk because I know that it has for some people. But the gospel of Jesus never changes. Good news today. Jesus died on a cross a couple of thousand years ago when he lived a perfect life. When the train was heading for us to wipe out humanity because of our sin and our mistakes and our errors, Jesus re-diverted that train and took it upon himself to carry your sin, your shame, your pain, your experiences, and all of those things for the people that have hurt you as well. Remember that, the person you can't stand, Jesus thought they were so good that he died for them as well. But it's time for us to represent him better and we're gonna do two things and then I'm done the first one. Um, as, we, as we enter this year, one of the things that we're gonna look to do more as, as, as a church at Bethel, um, on, on Sunday mornings in particular, is to provide the opportunity to, to, to bring people to church where the gospel is gonna be presented. Because if we're not doing that, then really what is the point? It's like a teaching, it's like a lecture. I've been in lectures all week. There's no point in just having a lecture. There's gotta be purpose to it. And we wanna do that, particularly on a Sunday morning, which will mean that hopefully this place will be busier for one, you might not get your parking spot, but that's okay because someone might go to heaven forever. But ultimately, the point being that, that I know that there are people in the room today that don't believe in Jesus or have never made a decision to believe in him. So we wanna give that opportunity right now. If you're in here today and you've never made a decision to follow him, I wanna assure you that the best decision of your life could, about to, could be about to be made. But the good news is it doesn't just go downhill from there. It just keeps getting better. That's the aim. 
But the gospel of Jesus is very simple, complicated by many, many years of theological viewpoints. God sent his son Jesus to this earth so that Jesus would live a perfect life. But then he was killed on a cross for all of mankind, for everybody, for your sin. But it didn't end there. Otherwise, he'd have just been a martyred legend that was pretty nice and healed a few people. Because three days later, he rose again, defeated death, got the ultimate victory. And that's why we're all here today. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna say a prayer and I'm gonna invite you to repeat the prayer after me, everybody in the room. And maybe if you are a believer, just pray with me right now that the Holy Spirit would stir somebody up to make a decision if they're in here today. And I know there'll be some that hearts going, uh oh, uh oh, I think he's gonna look at me. God's gonna tell him to point me out. Don't worry, he's not. It's nothing to do with me. It's all about him. So I'm gonna say a prayer. And if you've never made a decision or maybe you feel like you did and your, your life is like in that massive green box and you just feel like I need to go for this again, then I'm gonna say a prayer. I want you to repeat it after me. And then I'm gonna offer you the chance to just raise a hand if you've done that today. So everybody follow me. Lord Jesus, thank you for the opportunity to be in church today. Thank you that you died for me to bring hope to my world. Forgive me for all that I've done wrong. Amen. Please keep your eyes closed. If you prayed that prayer today and you feel like, yeah, that's, that's the time that I, I've just done that and it means something to me for the first time, I'm going to ask you just to put your hand in the air so that only I can see it. Just do that right now. Thank you. Thanks. Just keep it up just so that I can see. Thank you. Praise you, Jesus. Just going to give one more time. If there's anybody else and you feel like now is the time, just put your hand in the air. I'm not going to get you out the front and embarrass you, don't worry. Okay, put your hands down. Lord, thank you for those that have put their hand up today. Only you know where their hearts really are. Only you know where their life is, what their life experience is. But I pray right now, Lord Jesus, that they would know it to be true, not because of an emotional Sunday morning, but because in their heart of hearts, they know that what has been shared today is truth. And Lord, I pray that each of those would fill, their lives would be filled in the way that the first uh, example was and that it would never change, that they would go on to represent you in the best way possible. Amen. Amen. You know it says in heaven that the angels celebrate when someone makes a decision? I think we should celebrate because some people have put their hand up today and I believe a couple at least have probably done that for the first time. So should we celebrate? Should we put our hands together and encourage them? You know, if we really, really understood what that actually meant, we'd be going wild right now. Maybe it'll wait, I think, until heaven, until we truly celebrate, when we see what we could have gone to or what other people may have come, gone to. That's great news. Uh, if you did make that decision, please don't leave without seeing me. Um, we can give you something and, and support you. But the next thing we're gonna do, and then uh, I'm gonna ask the band to actually come up now, if you would, is that if you're in the room and you feel like, yeah, I've made a decision years ago, but my hope has dwindled to the point where it's not even as big as the ball in, that you showed. Or maybe you see yourself somewhere along that category and you need some fresh hope today. Now it might be that lots of people stand up and that's absolutely great. Or maybe one person stands up and that's just as great. But if that's you and you feel like today, January 2020, Lord Jesus, where I am at today, wherever you are at, if you feel like you need to get some more hope, fresh hope, that you overflow with hope, I'm gonna ask you to do something brave and just stand right now anybody that wants that and then i'm going to ask people to pray for you thanks you don't have to be the one at the end you don't have to think that it's a little bit of the corner you might even think that you're the one at the very start and you think i could do with some more fresh hope and if you're not sitting if you're not stood up it doesn't mean that you're a sinner <laughs> or that you've got all the hope in the world either we know that but as the band just gently play, what I'm going to ask is that, is that um, 
I can't pray for everybody, obviously, but if you're around this area, there are plenty of good, solid Christian people. To qualify to pray for somebody, you just need to be normal and a Christian. Just don't do anything weird, basically. So if you're happy to, to just do that, please, there are people stood around the room. Um, just, just go over and just, you don't need to ask them anything. You don't need to ask their life story. You can just pray for them. That would be absolutely awesome. So please, there are plenty of people in the room that are sitting down. You're not switching off. Please just go and stand with somebody and just put an arm around their shoulder and just pray for them. Please do that now as we sing. There's somebody up at the back there. If um, someone up there could do that too, that would be great. Um, let's make sure that nobody's left stood alone. So please just do that. If you've stood to be prayed for and there's not anybody around you, just put your hand up so that it's not confused that, that they do. But I think, uh, I think most people are covered. Thanks, Rach. We're just gonna continue to worship now, but um, I love that analogy with the train. But um, as Chris was just sharing about that, it just um, made me think that actually our analogy is even better. Well, our real story is even better with Jesus because not only did Jesus lay his down, life down um, willingly on that track, knowing exactly what was going to happen, it was it was planned for. He knew that there was going to be that we were in danger, and he willingly planned and laid down his life for us. And not only that, but the one who flipped the, chip, the switch was his father, his father God, who um, must have been crushed to to have to crush his own son, but also also loved us and knew that it was the only way for us to be able to come to him. So let's just yeah, let's just remember what the decision that we've made and um, whether it was you know 30 seconds ago or whether it was uh, 30 years ago or 40 or 50 or 60 or I don't know what's the longest time here but yeah let's just remember what it means um, as we continue to worship now. Your grace is enough more than I need at your word I will believe I will wait for you draw near again by your spirit make me new and I will fall at your first
God, we just thank you that you've been speaking to us this morning, Lord Jesus. We thank you so much for your hope, Lord Jesus. And Lord Jesus, I pray that your hope is big in our lives, Lord Jesus. We don't have to dig to find it, Lord Jesus, that we would be, as the verse said, overflowing with hope, Father God. That the people around us would say of us that we are overflowing with hope, Father God. Yeah, Lord Jesus, we just pray that you would overflow us with your Holy Spirit, Father God. That we wouldn't be able to contain what you've done inside us, Lord Jesus. That we would have to share it with the people around us, Lord Jesus. Whether that's by a different attitude, Lord Jesus. Whether that's by showing our hope. Or, Lord Jesus, whether that's by using our words, Father God. We pray that it would overflow out of us, Father God. And we thank you so much, Lord Jesus, for those people who made the decision today to trust you, Lord Jesus. I thank you that they, they have made such a good decision, Lord Jesus. I thank you that you are so good that you will never let them down. And Lord Jesus, I pray your protection over them now, Lord Jesus, that you will lead them to learn to know you more, Lord Jesus, to be more like you every day, Lord Jesus. Lord Jesus, we thank you that we have a secure hope in you, Lord Jesus, an eternal hope in you. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Amen. If you want to go and grab a tea or coffee now, you're more than welcome to. Or if you want to stay for a bit, if you're still having prayer, or if you haven't had prayer yet, you just be comfortable to do that now.